Okay. Right. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Ken. I'm here with Linkso, and we've got a fabulous talk by Randy today. Um, he's the founder of Malibu Compost, and he's done many classes for us before. And today, Randy's going to be talking about growing healthy soil. So, Randy, welcome, and the floor is all yours. All right. Hey, how's everybody doing? Um, I'm really happy to be here. Um, I am not the most tech savvy guy, so if we have any technical difficulties, bear with us. We had just a little snafu before we got on, so um, let's just see what happens. And I'm, um, you know, uh, we'll 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 make it happen. So um, I am. Uh, really uh, excited to be with you guys. I, I, I like, um, I love the fact that Linkso is very um, education savvy and uh, we've been doing classes together for a really long time. Uh, I've known Can for a long time. I've known Terry for a long time and um, they've been carrying our products for a really long time. And just, you know, a couple quick things um, about us. Um, we are, uh, we are, organic and biodynamic um, compost makers and we're farmers and gardeners. And um, I've been doing this a long time. Uh, before I started making compost, uh, I was a landscaper. I had the first, um, I had the first uh, eco landscaping company in Los Angeles. I started working with a bunch of old guys uh, who were really, really good. Um, I was, I was doing design work with them and a lot of photography, uh, had a lot of friends. I grew up surfing, had a lot of my friends that were, uh, became in the entertainment business in one way or another. And, uh, all of a sudden we started getting all these entertainment clients from my friends and, uh, Lo and behold, we have this entertainment division and the guys in the company put me in front of, in, in charge of it. And it started this whole process. And during that time, back in the early eighties, people were asking me all the time um, for healthy gardening practices, natural gardening practices, their, you know, natural landscaping. It, it was before we had organic in the United States. So uh, we were doing stuff that was pre-organic. Organic had started in Europe, but it really hadn't hit here. It became, started a little bit in the 90s and became a thing really here in the early 2000s. So uh, with that, I'm gonna go ahead and start. And um, so this is Growing Healthy Soil. I'm one of the founders of a company called Malibu Compost. I don't know if you guys, any of you guys have used us before. Uh, if you have, great, we appreciate that, thank you. Um, so, here we go. So let's see this. Um, I don't know why my, my, uh, ay, ay, ay. here we are having our first technical difficulty. Okay. So hang on a sec. All right. So organic review, we're going to start here. Um, so that happens to be a nice, uh, uh, natural biodynamic farm, as you can see, unmanicured. I love stuff like that. That just goes very kind of, Willy nilly and helter skelter, and 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 that's kind of how I like to I like to grow stuff personally myself. I like stuff to be some stuff in ground, some stuff in containers. I like to do a lot of different uh, you know unique kind of stuff. So organic review. So who in this class you know, and and some of you can answer you know if you answer you know Cam will let me know. Uh, uh, is an organic gardener, grower, farmer, teacher, student, consumer, you know, and why, you know, who eats, who buys, who shops organic food and organic products and why. Um, the main answer for most of us is, is because we think organic is better. We think organic is healthier. Uh, we believe that um, the powers that be are, um, uh, are, you know, taking care of organic in a way um, that uh, it's safer for us. Uh, we believe that there are rules and regulations in place that make organic um, a better option for us 
And if, you know, and then also, you know, which leads us down the road of health, if we have health and safety issues, you know, then organic is, you know, is better for us that way. Um, so we have all of those things that, you know, are uh, drivers as to why we're doing it. And then we go into, you know, stores like Trader Joe's or Sprouts or Whole Foods um, or, you know, up here in Oregon, New Seasons, um, or our local co-ops, you know, the Berkeley Bowl, you go in these places, right? And all of them, you know, are, are pushing the, the organic message, the biodynamic message, this message that, you know, um, organic is better. And then we get into nurseries and you even get into places like, you know, um, uh, Lingso, and they've got, you know, stuff that's organic, most of their stuff, I believe, is organic. Some stuff that may just be natural, but most of their stuff is organic and, and is registered organic. And so that, you know, that customer base is going to buy organic. Um, we have organic soaps. We have organic perfumes. We have all of this stuff, biodynamic and organic wines. We're, we're constantly being hit with this organic, you know, messaging. Um, and even such that, you know, the big, you know, Kroger and the big stores and all those big chains, you know, um, you know, hey, you can even go into a CVS and buy organic stuff. So where did organic come from? So originally organic, you know, came from, uh, it came from um, Aristotle and his treatise on logic, which is Organon. And then it left the root of organic left um, logic and then got into um, the whole idea um, uh, of reasoning, which is very interesting to me, uh, which, you know, came from bacon. And, you know, I don't mean, you know, the bacon that you can eat. So, what is organic today? What does it mean to us? So organic today, and I put it up there, the basic definition of organic is food produced with feed or fertilizer of plant or animal origin without fertilizers, growth stimulants, antibiotics, or pesticides. So that's all pretty good. That sounds pretty good. That sounds like it relates back to what I was saying originally, why we're buying organic. So who's in charge of organic? Who's the, who, you know, who's the boss? You know, who runs organic? Who, you know, what, what mafia, you know, is, is, is the, you know, is the head of, of organics? Well, I've got the USD organic logo there. We've all seen the little circle with USD organic on it, right? So basically um, the national organic program is the regulatory program, the body of, of, law that runs what is organic and not organic in our country and it's headed up by the USDA. The group that actually runs and there's a there's a National Organic Standards Board there but the group that actually runs um, the organic standards is the AMS which is the Agricultural Marketing Services and that's why I put the double question mark there because Think about what I just told you guys. Okay, so the agricultural marketing services run the organic program. And what they say on their, on their part of the website is not that we are responsible for developing national standards for organically produced agricultural products. Our regulations do not address food safety or nutrition. What they do address is how does the United States navigate and control a market that's now hundreds of billions of dollars? It started out as hundreds of millions, millions, then hundreds of millions, then billions, and now it's hundreds of billions of dollars. So what we do now in this country is we control the organic market. I'm giving you guys this as a background. So you kind of think about like, okay, so who's controlling this? So for me, what that does for me is I'm, a, I'm an organic farmer. The products that we make are certified organic. I have to deal with organic 
um, uh, certifications and organic certifiers. So I have to deal with the CDFA in California. I deal with the ODA in Oregon and the WSDA in Washington. And I deal with organic certifiers all over the country. The certain states make us pay them to sell our products in their states and certain states don't. Um, so making compost for us, compost is not a fertilizer, it's an amendment, but I still have to deal with these guys. So for me, I look at it and I go, it's really interesting that a, a, a group that has marketing in their title is in charge of an organic program. So let's talk about the protocols of, of an organic garden. Cause I'm assuming most of you guys that are on this mat, on this uh, Zoom uh, meeting here are organic gardeners or organic growers or organic farmers or in some way an organic educator, you're involved in organics on some level. So, you know, baseline stuff that we're gonna talk about real quickly is um, we're gonna talk about, you know, how we, use organics and how we use stuff that's what I believe is really organic in the garden um, to go ahead and um, create the cleanest, safest, healthiest space that you can have. And, and, and everything that you're hearing here is my opinion, you know, so it's not like, um, you know, uh, you know, um, and my, it's my opinion from a lot of years of experience and a lot of years of trial and error and a lot of years of, um, you know, uh, learning um, from getting dirty and learning, you know, from my mistakes and watching, you know, um, watching um, experts, um, you know, uh, tell me things that later on I found out weren't true uh, and so or had little pieces of truth but then when I looked at the whole all the fabric of it it wasn't you know it wasn't true so um, that's kind of so this whole thing is just you know coming from my vantage point as a guy who was uh, a landscaper who you know put in irrigation dug trenches got into uh, design work, did photography, got a bunch of licenses, had a contractor's license, a pool building license, had a great masonry crew, a landscape crew, bought the company that I worked for from these old guys that had gray hair like me now, um, and um, designed a lot of really cool stuff, got into the very forefront of the echo landscape level uh, revolution, and, um, and then realized all of this soil that I was getting from the soil yards and all the products that I was buying was a bunch of crap. And it was, um, and this is back in the early eighties and the mid eighties. And I, and I couldn't find anything that was really good. And I was trying to find stuff to, to jack soil up and to create things, you know, so I was reading as much stuff as I could. And I was meeting as many different types of farmers and vintners and people like that, that I could to learn everything that I could um, to change what I was doing as a landscaper. Um, so I was learning about soil structure, I was learning about, you know, starting to learn about, you know, stuff I tuned out, you know, um, on in high school, like I wasn't interested in microbes, you know, I wasn't interested in hearing what my biology teachers were talking about. All of a sudden, when uh, Alan York, a guy who I met who's a vintner at Benzinger Vineyard, starts talking to me about microbes in his compost and about how aerobic bacteria is really, really important um, to uh, the soil structure that he's creating on, um, you know, on his uh, vineyard, you know, and the next vineyard that he's about to create in Chile, you know, I'm starting to now listen and go back to what were these guys talking about like back in, in high school? Like, you know, I was more worried about like, hey, was Malibu going off? You know, do we have a South Swell coming in? Or, you know, was Rincon breaking in Santa Barbara? And, you know, you know, did I have the right board in my truck? Um, but now I'm starting to focus in on, hey, I better start paying attention here. And maybe 
this is the key why the soil and the plants that aren't performing as well as they should on the landscape projects that I'm getting paid to steward over and paid to install and paid to watch over and then hand off to some gardener who is an alleged gardener who really has no idea about gardening. They're basically just coming in to tidy up and mow and blow and keep things clean and, um, but not really garden um, in the sense of like probably what I, I think and hope most of you guys do in terms of gardening and what I know I do and I know what my wife does in terms of gardening. Gardening is a lot of work and it, and it takes a lot of passion and a lot of love and a lot of care and you have to really love working in a garden to actually be a gardener. Um, I know on my wife's license plate frame it says um, I'd rather be gardening. <laughs> so um, there's a woman who is dedicated to the world of gardening. So, you know, basic soil structure, you guys, you know, starts with microbes. It's the oldest, you know, living organism on this planet. Um, uh, microbes, the bacteria puts out a, a gummy sticky substance, a polysaccharide, and that grabs other, um, that grabs other um, uh, aggregates that are broken down um, from water and from other things that break down over time and pressure and then fungal hyphae, fungal filament um, are kind of like a web-like -like structure that pull all of that stuff together and start to create soil. And that, so soil just doesn't happen. It's created by biology. So one of the things that I'm hoping today that you guys will, if you're already not thinking that way, um, I'm hoping that you'll you'll care a lot more about the microbes in your garden and the biology in your garden, and that you might be um, even one-tenth or one-twentieth uh, more of a biological farmer when we, when we sign off today, or a biological gardener, or a biological grower, that you, know, um, you may, when you walk out into your garden the next time, you know, you know, raise your fist and go power to the microbes because they are the most powerful. They are amazing. When you think about, you know, just in your yard, you know, trillions of microbes in a, in a very small space doing amazing amounts of work. And, and, and I mean, when you look out at a hillside somewhere where you live and you see stuff growing, plants growing on a hillside and no one's ever fertilized that, no one's ever given it any food, who's given it food are the microbes because what they're doing is they're doing what's called nutrient cycling. And what they're doing is they're breaking down all the organic matter from the, from the soil animals to the earthworms to then the, the microscopic, um, uh, uh, the microbes are breaking down that organic matter, taking all that nutrient that's in there, all the mineral that's in there. Um, and then larger animals come and eat them and eat those things and poop them out. And all that nutrient that's in there, major and minor nutrients gets cycled uh, into the rhizosphere, the root level of the, of the, uh, of the plants and uptake into the plants. And that's what keeps everything going. That's what keeps everything alive. That's how you know, we've survived for forever until we started to figure out farming, until we started to figure out how do you mimic nature? So, what we're going to talk about next real quickly is, is about um, mimicking nature and about protocols for an organic garden. So the key, so just, you know, and I just have a lot of different pictures in here of like different stuff that we do. Like, so this is just a compost bin, like one of the ones that we make all the time. Like this is one at one of the job sites that my wife works at where it, you know, um, this one happens to be a, a redwood one, you know, um, there's another one that's coming up like a, a cedar one that we make that's you just make slats and they're two sided um, compost bins and we take all of the leaf material and all the green material that's on the sites and we go ahead and compost there. Uh, we don't use a lot of the food waste in some of these um, because um, uh, you can get a lot of issues with them. We use a lot of food waste in worm bins um, on our sites and see that we have a lot less rodent issues and, and um, other pest issues and other issues with other types of animals because we live out in um, uh, pretty natural, pretty wild 
areas and you kind of want to watch that stuff. And even areas that are kind of close to the suburbs, you can get some pretty wild stuff happening. So, so the key, so composting is like the main key, good finished compost that you buy or you make. Um, there are, you know, several, you know, kind of composts out there. There's farm compost, which is what we do on our farms at Malibu Compost. Um, there's city compost, which everybody, you know, gets the green bins and throws all their junk in there. Um, you know, there's veggie compost. Now you have a lot of people that are taking veggie waste from restaurants and stores and, you know, they're going even around to all the stuff when the stuff goes bad at the markets and, you know, turning that into compost. Um, there's green waste compost from the bins. There's different animal compost. There's the, you know, the chicken um, manure from, you know, from some good chicken farms, but then there's a lot of, a lot of the, of the conventional battery cage style chicken, you know, uh, manure, which is not good. Um, and then also, uh, you know, and then home composting. So for me, if you guys aren't home composting, I hope you all will home, home compost, uh, really, really important. It does a bunch of stuff. You know, you, um, it brings your indigenous microbes into play, you know, what you have in your space into play and what's in your region into play into your garden, gets it back into your garden and you feed other microbes with, with the biology that you have there. And then the other thing that happens there, it also makes you start thinking about what you're sourcing, what you're growing and what's happening there. It's a really nice thing to do. The key to all of this is, you know, what's in it. So here's like some of the home composting things I was telling you about. So the one there that's that's on the left there, um, that's like a, that's a cedar composting um, unit that we built at our place that's um, backs up into the, uh, the, the backyard there is the Santa Monica Mountains basically. Um, that's at the top of, uh, of uh, our orchard. Um, you know, and we just have buckets where we're bringing up stuff and what we're doing here on the right is just putting in a bunch of, you know, a bunch of uh, leaf litter that we collected. So we kind of, when we start these kind of composting setups, we do kind of like a 50-50 mix. We, you know, do greens and browns and we wet, you know, we wet everything in with our um, watering wand as we're putting everything in and then, you know, and then we'll do that again as we start to turn it. So we make them two-sided as you can see in the picture there so that we can, as we turn it, when we're flipping it to the other side, we're spraying it with water as well. So it stays wet as we're turning it. And then we, and then we finally get to that place where we turn it and we'll let it sit and then let it start to go through that process where, um, because this is a this is a more passive type of composting. Uh, what we do on the farm is big windrows, and so those it's it's uh, real hot um, with manure and wood chips, and it gets 140 145 degrees very quickly. So it's thermophilic composting and not passive at all. We're trying to get um, it to get very hot very quickly, and then get through 15 days of turning um, and pathogen reduction which we have to do for our state regulations and also to make sure that it's clear of all pathogens. So you guys don't get any E. coli, salmonella, listeria, that kind of stuff. Um, you know, so here's, you know, everybody's seen the green bins, you know, we get this kind of stuff, like those are the green bins in Santa Monica, California, where everybody throws their yard wastes and their, you know, and, and their food scraps and all kinds of stuff in there. The problem with that, like especially in you know in urban areas, is people also throw their dog crap and baby diapers and you know car batteries and and that kind of screws up. You know, it's like when you're home composting back in those systems that I showed you before, and we're, and we're farm composting at our place. Hey, we get to control you know what's going in there. But like when you're you know when you have all these people kind of cruising by and just like stopping off at your dump at your green bin and like going, oh yeah, the baby, you know, went to the bathroom and it stinks in the car and boom, we're throwing that diaper in there. It's like, there you go. Um, and then, you know, over here on the other side, you know, you've got municipal compost and you can even see in there just so much crap, so much garbage, so much stuff that just is like not conducive, you know, in terms of, you know, cleanliness, organics, there's a lot of toxicity that get that comes from municipal, you know, composting. So I tell people all the time, like, do I use city compost? Hell no, I don't ever. You know, I just don't use it because they don't have it under control. And because people don't care enough as a society yet to make sure 
that you know they you know the average person isn't acting as a steward of this planet yet and that's part of what i hope you know all of us guys can get out as a message which is like hey we have one home here guys let's try to do our best you know to to make it a, a great home all right so worms you know so um you know I love worm bins, you know, and then there's castings versus vermicompost. Castings are really tough to get a true casting that's like super, super clean. Um, you know, so uh, most of the time you're getting a mixture of what the bedding is, what, the, what you're feeding your worms, all that kind of stuff, you know. So um, we use worm bins all the time. We use red worm bins. I've given you a couple different type of, um, you know, of, uh, of the red worms. Um, we add castings to all the soil mixes that we make. When we start our worm bins, uh, what we do is I take compost and I put it in the bottom of the worm bin. And then we put the, we put the, the, uh, the worms into the bin. And then we, we do a lot of juicing at our house. And so what we do, is we then feed every, um, we feed the worms, the, the pulp. And it's kind of cool because then you, you, you start on one side, it's like the old typewriter, and then they kind of, they'll just keep following the pulp. And then um, what happens is ultimately you get them over to one side and you can go and kind of clean out um, the castings that are in the bottom, you know, and, and uh, um, from where they've gone and eaten, and then you start on your way back. It works, it works really well. Um, these are the worm bins that we use. Uh, they're like, they may, a lot of different companies make them. I think these ones are this company called Wiggle Wanch or something like that. Um, that little thing on the, why I showed the picture on the left is there's a little spout on there. Um, I don't, I've had a lot of people come to me like at flower and garden shows in different places and say, oh, I make compost tea all the time and I feed it to my, I feed it to my garden. You know, and I go, oh, really? They're like, so where do you get your compost tea from? They're like, oh, in my worm bin. I, you know, I, 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 you know, I get all this stuff that you know builds up in the bottom of it, and then I pour it out of the bottom of there, and I and I put it in my garden. And here's just a heads up: if anybody's doing that, um, this is not to scold you or say anything. You, you know, but if stuff is sitting in the bottom of your seeping in there, and it's wet, and it's dark, and it's dank, and it's just sitting in there it could be going anaerobic. So for me, I don't use that stuff that's in there. Like unless you can use it real fresh and cut it with some water and just use it very quickly, okay? Um, don't just let it sit in there for like, you know, all of a sudden go like, oh yeah, it's like two months and it's time to clear the worm juice out. You know, don't do it. Um, what happens is if you do that and you keep it clear and keep everything going, what you're looking at on the right side, I know it's a tough picture to see, but you, that is all really beautiful castings in the bottom tray of our worm bin. And so what we do is we just then op take that, that, those other you know, uh, tops off and then we get in there and then we just you know, scrape that out and we use, um, and there's no, you know, no, basically no worms in there because there's no food source in there. The food source is up in the top. And then you go ahead and you um, use the castings in either any soil mix you're doing. Uh, I love adding this to my indoor house plants. The house plants love castings. And I love adding this as a light top dressing, like 16th of an inch, you know, just into some of my, um, my uh, uh, containers and, and food beds. Amending um, is really important, and what how, what you amend and you you know use or don't use is super important. Um, so, uh, you know, uh, using simples, and when I say a simple, it means a sim all simple means is a, a, a one. It's a one thing. It means it's not a combination of things. So, a simple would be. Um, uh, like a kelp meal or an organic alfalfa meal or a fishbone meal or a mine basalt, you know, like an azomite um, or um, uh, um, let's see what else would I use. Uh, sometimes I use like bentonite clay. Um, so the things I don't ever use, I never use bone meal, blood meal, feather meal or cottonseed meal. 
So when I'm talking to you here, I'm talking, remember, we're talking about the keys, right? The keys to an organic garden. So why wouldn't I ever use bone meal, blood meal, feather meal, or cottonseed meal? Anybody know? I know, I know Can knows because she's heard me, she's heard me blabber, blabber, blabber on about this a million times. Okay, so the reason we don't use those things is because all of those things come from, except for the cottonseed meal, that comes from a conventional farm, but the other items come from farms where the animals are fed conventional GMO feedstocks. And the GMO feedstocks, <clears throat> corn, soy, alfalfa, they're all sprayed, they're all Roundup ready, so they're all sprayed with broad spectrum herbicide. Um, and then on the last one, the cottonseed meal, heavily, heavily sprayed with pesticide. So those things do not cook out in their cleaning out phase or their composting phase or whatever they do when they allegedly steam that stuff or clean that stuff. It's in there, it's in the bone, it's in the blood. And the other thing that happens too, this is interesting. I was doing a class on um, Saturday down in Laguna Beach and uh, Ruben, the guy that owns uh, Laguna Nursery said, you know, I, you know, I unfortunately have, I, I have a family member that lives by a slaughter yard and I would, we were by there, you know, and I, and I, I, you know, heard, you know, that the animals are in a lot of fear as they get to the slaughter yard. Is that true? And I said, yeah, it is true. And um, I said, because they smell the blood, they smell what happens as they get, you know, they're on the, on the transports going in. I know I rescued, you know, if you guys ever, if you're ever bored and you want to read a great story and it's not great just because it involves us, it's a great story. Um, on our website, malibucompost.com, if you go on there on the about us section, don't read the about us part about the humans, forget us, we don't matter. Um, go on to the about us part and read the story of Boo. That's the cow that we, um, she was the first cow we rescued and she became our spokes cow. And she was on her way to the slaughter. She was at a slaughter auction and was going to go to slaughter when we rescued her. And it was a great story and she really, um, help change my life and help save my life. And um, I believe help change the direction of our company and um, helped, um, helped cement the values of our company uh, in terms of uh, caring about people, planet and animals. So I did tell Ruben that, yeah, animals know they, they get scared, it's a horrible thing. The, the sounds that come out of there are not good. And um, he said, well, is that in the blood meal and the bone meal and the feather meal uh, as well? And I said, for sure in the blood meal. I mean, for sure that, 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 that fear in the adrenaline kick, my belief, that's, this is my belief again, it's there. Because as we all know, as humans, you know, fear is a very, very, very powerful emotion, but also it's also backed by adrenaline. And that's, you know, in our bloodstream and it's very, um, it's, it's super strong. So that's just a, I thought that was an interesting side point that Ruben brought up at a class this weekend. Um, so in amending, um, so here's a, here's an azomite, down to Earth is a, I, I know a company that, uh, that um, uh, links those cells. I know Can um, sells their products. They make really good products. BioLive is one, it's not a simple, it's a combined product. And there's a lot of um, really good, it's a mix I've used several times. Um, if you're looking for something that's got a lot of different natural and organic fertilizer in there, in there the BioLive is great. Um, I'm going to tell you guys how to use it. The last set segment here um, of the of the class. Um, so I love that product as well. Um, here's their organic kelp meal, which is great. Here's your options on kelp meal. You can use a you can use a simple like that out of a box, you know, or 
this is another company that I love these guys. They're a great family. Um, they're on the East Coast. Um, they're Gloucester, Massachusetts family, and they um, have a company called Neptune Harvest. And they do, um, they do a uh, cold pressed seaweed and they do a cold pressed fish. Um, both products are excellent. I, I've used both of them in my um, compost tea brews. Uh, and I've also just um, uh, uh, taken um, the, uh, the seaweed extract and um, diluted it and put it in my backpack sprayer and sprayed everything um, once in a while just to kind of perk the garden up. Especially like when we hit times like, you know, you guys are in California, right? So I, I, I um, have lived in California for a long time, have a farm in California. Um, now I, I live in Oregon. We have a farm here too. Um, but we're really dry. I just left, you know, home in Ventura County in California and man, it is so dry. And, you know, right now, um, I just, uh, I just told the guys back at home, um, the next time the temperatures drop a little bit to go out and just kind of give the orchard a spray and the, and the veggie garden a spray, um, with, uh, a, a little of, uh, Neptunes in a, in a, just a, a Hudson sprayer diluted pretty strong but just give it a just just to freshen it up because um just to get some um just to get uh some fluid into the leaf structure of the plants because right now they're they haven't had any moisture you know in terms of rain through their leaves through the stomata at all so they're just dry and um you know, and we're all on, I don't think you guys are yet because we aren't in Berkeley yet. Um, everyone's on, uh, we're not on rationing yet, but we're on recommended, you know, rationing. Um, but down in Southern California, everyone's on rationing right now. So, you know, just, just beware. So it's a good thing to do just to kind of freshen everything up a little bit. Um, another key is on the bag soils, you know, um, I always flip the bags over, um, you know, the key to see like what's in it. Like, and what I'm looking for, is there any bone meal? Is there any blood meal? Is there any feather meal? Is there a chicken manure in there? Like, where did the chicken manure come from? Did it come from a fabulous chicken farm, you know, with, with you know, with wild, you know, with chickens running wild that are free range, you know, and how'd they collect it? I know like for us, um, the only reason that we're able to collect a lot of manure on the organic dairy farms is because we um, have loafing sheds where the cows go in and lay down because they're heavy animals, they're big, they need to get that pressure off their knees and off their legs and off their ankles, right? Um, and and when it's really hot, they have to lay down because it's really stressful on their hearts um, and on their lungs. And when it's really cold and rainy, it's very dangerous for them in terms of breaking their legs. Um, so they go in. So we have to have big loafing sheds. And what we do is we put, we fill those loafing sheds up with these really good wood chips, alder. And we buy the wood chips from the forest department. And the cows go in and lay down and they're super comfortable. And one of the nice things that happens from that is that the cows, um, they, they get a reduced incidence of having mastitis because, because dairy cows and conventional dairies get mastitis all the time and they get shot up because, they get, um, because their teats close up. Um, so for us, because the oils on the woods and, and everything and the cows are inside and they're comfortable, they produce more milk, they're very comfortable, they're very clean. Um, it's really nice. So we get all that manure that happens there. And then when the cows go to the milking shed that's right by where the loafing shed is, we get all the manure that's there as well. So we, you know, out in the pastures, that's, that, that just goes out there and takes care of the pastures, right? But we have two areas, two large areas where we're able to capture manure. And one of those areas is a beautiful balance of nitrogen and carbon, you know, in that, in that loafing shed. So, and then, and then we have the other area where we kind of wash, you know, or, or, we, or we scrape and pull the stuff out of the milk barns and get that stuff out. And we are able to then put that into big windrows and that's how we're able to get enough material. So, you know, so I'm not knocking the chicken manure industry, but 
but I know where our stuff comes from. I know where the, what the cows eat. So I went back to the, the GMO thing real quick. I started testing our stuff for GMOs 13 years ago um, because I wanted to know two things. We, we, our farms are in no spray zones. I wanted to know, were we getting any overspray? Were, did we have anybody that was in an organic no spray zone that shouldn't be spraying or that was growing non-organic crops that shouldn't be? Um, and the other thing I wanted to know was, was our stuff safe? And so we started testing because I wanted to make sure that we didn't have any GMO, um, re, you know, any, any residue in there so that I knew that nothing was being sprayed on our stuff. So we did a genetic IDs and then we also went to the, the most amount of testing I could do, which was 163 compounds that were in pesticides, herbicides and fungicides. So we started testing to see if we had any of those things that were in those, and that way I knew we were okay, we were safe. So this is a little factory farming thing, you know, meat and bone meal, you know, and also, hey, you know, about spraying, you know, little little joke about spraying, but not really that funny. Um, so mulching, you know, a lot of questions right now about mulching. People are asking me all the time, hey, do you mulch? Are you mulching? You know, saving water, are you mulching? Um, I'm a like 50-50 believer in mulching. I'm not like a huge believer in mulching because, you know, historically what's happened is, um, you know, the cities and the counties have like told everybody, oh, get wood mulch, you know, put wood mulch down, put wood mulch down, you know, and people, you know, and then you have like, you go to Home Depot and Lowe's and, and you have all this, you know, like colored mulch and stuff that I don't know, it's to me is ridiculous, but I guess some people think it's pretty or I don't know. Well, I don't know what they think it is, but it's, it's, um, I think it adds stuff into the soil that you don't want to add. I think um, when you get um, stuff from tree trimmers, you know, it would be really good to know your tree trimmer and know where the, uh, where the trimmings came from. You know, um, I, uh, when I was originally, uh, when we originally got the property up in Ventura County, up on the hill there, and we were planting the orchard, um, that property had a lot of wood mulch all over it and it came from um, local uh, tree trimmers. And so what we did was, I was like, okay, I'm not gonna take all this wood mulch off of here. I'm gonna work with it. And what I did was I started um, using compost tea and started to, um, I, had, I, had a, um, I had some really sick um, trees that were in there that were landscape trees because the people let the irrigation spray on the trunks of the trees and they had all kinds of fungal disease that were, um, the trees were basically dying and they were really sick. So I had, I had several trees I had to take out. I had a couple of trees I was able to save using biodynamic tree paste and compost tea. Um, and I kept the wood mulch there and I just started spraying it with compost tea and I started using stuff like SLF 100, which is a bacterial enzyme and just started throwing compost on there and just breaking it down. And eventually it became, it really helped break the soil down and also it helped hold moisture on that hillside. Um, so that by the time I was ready to plant all of the, the I had a bunch of, um, uh, trees that we've been, you know, kind of carting around and different, different bare root stock that we'd been saving and, and finding and, and putting in five gallon buckets and containers that we would grow in baby boo soil. And, um, and while we were waiting for the right spot to put those into the ground and uh, different, different avocados and rare apples and all kinds of stuff. So you know, so I was really happy that I'd kept that um, mulch, you know, on, uh, on that hillside. And, and so when we planted those trees, we had really good soil under there. So I would say um, using the woody mulch on hillsides um, in a very light way um, can be 
really good, can hold, uh, you know, can hold, can stop some of the erosion, can stop some of the, can keep some of the moisture that's in there, especially if you get any of that, any morning dew, anything like that. Um, um, one of the issues is everybody's gone to drip, you know, and part of the issue with drip is it makes you get really dry soil everywhere. Um, so, you know, I'm a person who I water by hand my raised beds. Um, I water and I also can control how much I water um, and make sure that the stuff that I, that I need to have water gets watered. Um, a lot of times with drip, um, unless you're checking your emitters all the time, um, they clog up a lot. Ants get in there and turn them. Ants get in there and clog them. Um, other uh, animals do as well. Um, you know, I like leaving other things, little fountain things and things like that for bees and other um, pollinators to get moisture from. Uh, so I'm always careful about that kind of stuff. I like, um, I take my uh, out on that farm uh, over uh, and Ventura, I do a lot of, I shred a lot of sycamore leaves and use them. Um, in my berry beds, I use organic straw. Um, and then in some areas, I just use compost as my mulch because compost holds moisture and, you know, it, um, it gets a nice crust. And I saw this yesterday out on our farm here in Oregon. It's really interesting. Um, I wasn't here for a few weeks. I had, it was getting stuff ready to come up here to move. Um, and I was a little worried because we had a bunch of 90, 90, 95 degree days up here. And in Oregon, it's a little different when it gets 90, 95, it's very different than California. It gets humid and our soil here where our farm is here just sucks moisture out of the, out of the compost like crazy. And um, I was worried we might be a little bit low on moisture in the, in the windrows and I was gonna have to get our water wagon out. Uh, we have a well, so we're on top of a river, so we don't have the same water issues um, as we're having in California uh, on our farm down there. Uh, but there was such a hard crust on top of the compost that when I, <laughs> I had to like really dig in, you know, like really dig in. And um, when I got through the surface, the moisture inside there was really beautiful. So that's another reason I also sometimes like compost as a, as a, um, as a mulch because it really can harden on the surface um, and hold moisture in, um, uh, in certain things, like in, in certain you know, food areas. Um, I use a little bit of, uh, I use a little bit of alfalfa pellet um, in my roses and some of my other flowering plants, just really small amounts, like a handful in a um, three, three to five gallons of water can like really be a great mulch for your flowering plants and roses and really last a long time. And it does a really good job. So you don't need to have a whole bunch of stuff in there. So that kind of thing works great in terms of a mulch. Um, Beneficial insects. So I'm hoping that you guys are using beneficials, you know, at this point. Um, and if you, I'm assuming most of you know, you're looking at a picture of a lace wing. Um, if, um, if you don't know, you can control most of uh, your pests um, at soil level. And so I gave you a pretty good list on here um, by using um, the HB and the SC nematodes you can literally, uh, they will hunt and kill the larva of white fly, thrips, um, leaf miner, aphids, grubs, um, and they do a great job. So uh, every time I'm adding soil or I'm refreshing my beds or I've gone through a season um, and I'm adding, um, I'm gonna add some, some soil into a raised bed or I'm gonna add um, a layer of new soil um, into an area maybe that I've rowed, um, that, that I'm fixing some bad soil in there, I always add nematodes into the soil. Uh, and for you guys that are growing indoor, if anybody is on here growing cannabis, um, you have to. You cannot rely on the fact that like soil, bag soil, 
depending on where it's come from and where they've, where it's been stored, where it was distributed, what truck it was on, you get fungus gnats. Okay, anybody that has a house plant has little fruit flies or fungus gnats. They 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 come. They're there all the time. They're in the soil. Okay, use nematodes. They go away. Okay, it'll wipe them out. Happen real easily. I get this question from cannabis growers a million times. I got bag soil. There's fungus gnats in there. It's terrible. What do I do? Do what I do. Get some nematodes, fill up your bucket with the nematodes in water and drench your beds, get rid of them. You'll be fine. If you get a bag of soil and you open it up and a bunch of gnats fly out then take the bag outside and let them, let them fly to the sunlight of death. <laughs> I mean, you know, you, you, the, the, you, there's easy ways to take care of it. Lace wings. I love lace wings. You can get, you know, so, you know, um, uh, aphids, man. So here's a great thing on these guys. I, I had at the entry of our house, I had a couple plants where it just had aphids all the time. I got a couple cards uh, uh, of lace wings, put them out there for two or three years. Every season, they would actually just repopulate and wipe out the aphids. And I have no aphids there anymore. And I also have no lace wings there anymore because they don't need to be there. They're gone. They did their mission. They took care of their job. They're gone. Ladybugs work really well. The problem with ladybugs is people don't put them out at dusk. They don't spray um, the area where they're having the infestation um, with enough water so that the ladybugs can drink, get rehydrated, and then go start killing. That's all you got to do. Use, don't use other stuff when you can use um, insects to take care of the problem. And the other thing, by giving, by amending and doing the stuff I was talking about earlier, you're going to go ahead and you're going to make the, the um, hormones of your plants really strong. And they're going to be able to fight off infestations because they have the right strength and stamina from the nutrients that they're absorbing. And that's really, really important. The other thing to me that's just huge, you know, oh, there's ladybugs being released right now. And man, they're just, they work incredibly well. We've, people that say they don't work, I'm telling you, I've, we've used hundreds of thousands of them in orchards and in other grows and they work fantastic. So here's my favorite thing. I love compost tea and I love compost tea, not just brewing tea. I love compost tea extracts. And that's what these are. These are two five gallon buckets with compost, little five little compost tea bags that we make these bags. They're easy. You throw a little bag, little organic cotton muslin bag in there, let them soak overnight, and then you use them. They're in incredible. And then you let them soak for eight hours and then you stir them. So compost teas, um, they are effective as a spray on powdery mildew. Um, they're really good as a root stimulant. They're, they are, um, they mitigate transplant shock. Um, they're great when you spray them as a foliar uh, on the stomata, top and bottom of your plants. They help that hormonal growth I was talking about and that hormonal resistance on the plants um, help the plant uptake nutrient really, really well at that level, at a leaf level, at a foliar level. Um, and they're great because what a compost tea will do as a drench, it feeds the plant and it feeds the soil with microscopic bacteria at the same time. So you're feeding not only the soil, but you're feeding your plant at the same time. And you're getting, because you have the heaviness of nutrient, major and minor nutrients and trace minerals, you have the heaviness of, of the water take carrying that down into the soil, that is getting it to the root level for uptake into the plant. So 
composting, if you look at all the stuff I talk about here, so if you have, if you get powdery mildew on your, on your tomatoes, on your cannabis, on your squash, uh, pumpkins, on your roses, huge on roses, guys. I, I, I'm a guy with 60 roses. I, I'm spraying compost tea all the time. Grapes. Um, you can even have success, you know, with uh, uh, Phytophthora and Fusarium if you hit it early enough. And, and um, you know, so it's another great thing to do. Um, and here's what I'm doing here. You can also use it just in your watering can. I'm dumping that compost tea that we just made into a watering can and using it that way. You can, you can do the same thing with that as a drench. It works beautifully. Diseases. One of my favorite things, one of the most inexpensive and smartest things you can do is use Dr. Bronner's. You can get it at Trader Joe's. I, uh, you can get it a lot of places, right? I use it all the time. You use it at one teaspoon to five gallons and, and it's great. Uh, white fly hate it, aphids hate it. You spray it in the morning early. Do not spray it in the afternoon. Do not spray it when the sun's out and it's hot. It works great. Another thing I love is EM1, effective microorganisms. So it's a lactic uh, uh, acid bacteria. Uh, it's great. They make one that you can drink. It's got, this got, has 43 different bacteria in it. Uh, the one they make for humans has like seven or eight different bacteria in it. I drink it all the time. Um, it's a great way uh, to break down organic matter. It's a great thing also to use, spray on compost bins that aren't breaking down, compost piles. Fantastic. And it's another way just to add a different form of biology into your soil. All right, so growing soil. This, this picture I wanted to show you guys. This was a lawn that was a crappy dead, terrible lawn that was at the property when we moved in. And what we've done there is create an area where um, we just keep growing different crops in this area. And I, all I keep doing is I keep mounting it and I keep putting compost in it. And that area is becoming super fertile. And it's becoming an area where, I, you know, it used to be a water sucker, a water waste. It was a, it was a lawn. And now it's a, a place where, you know, I keep growing different crops in there and, and they keep growing amazingly, amazingly well. And that was an area three years ago that was just a, a dead water zone. So, so basically, I want you guys to compost every spring and every fall at a half an inch to an inch of finished homemade compost or with booze blend or a combination of the composts, but it has to be a good finished compost, and, I, and why I say a home compost, and I, booze compost, I know what it is, I make it. At home, I like your home compost idea because you guys are controlling the inputs. So if it's not mine and it's not yours and you're gonna buy something else, be that obnoxious person that asks a ton of questions, okay? Um, so the other thing too, compost tea, the whole garden, everything. Um, every um, spring, summer, and fall. I added summer into there because right now with things being so dry, it's really important to get that extra little hit of moisture in there. Um, and especially um, the veggies and the roses, you wanna do them once a month. So like every three or four weeks, drench your raised beds, your food beds, and, and, and drench your roses. Um, and a drench is equal to a normal watering. That's all it is. It's normal watering. Um, top dress with the, like what I was telling you about the simples with kelp, alfalfa, fishbone meal, green sand, mineral, soft rock, phosphate, oyster shell at a 16th of an inch over your raised beds, over your garden plots, if you're in a community garden, um, over your containers and planting areas and then cover those with a half an inch of your compost or booze blend or a combination. And then you water them in. And you're, what you're gonna do is you're gonna do that after each big seasonal grow. So then you're gonna do that and you're gonna cover that, okay? And, and, and that's, so what that will do is keep your soil growing and keep your soil getting strong and keep your soil established and more importantly, it's gonna keep fostering the biology that's in that soil, keep growing that biology that's in the soil. And 
after three to four weeks after amending, you're going to drench all of those planting areas with compost tea. You're going to refeed. You're going to refeed. You're going to revitalize with compost tea. So what we're doing here, there's a there's a theme here. We're we're using compost and uh, we're using compost as as our long term, long haul, slow release biological and natural fertilizer. And then we're using some natural amendments and organic amendments very lightly at a 16th of an inch. And then we're adding compost tea with more frequency into the garden as that food for the soil and for your plants. And to keep and to lighten things up and to keep breaking up soil, breaking up clay, refreshing everything super important and to keep that soil that you've got going going especially as things dry out you got to keep it going and then the other thing the last thing i'll leave you with on this this part you guys is if you're planting in the ground please make sure you dig the hole the next size larger and then i do a mix and I've, I, I get, I, we get hired all the time as consultants to do all kinds of stuff, right? So I'm telling you something that I do all the time. Um, I do uh, a planting mix of one third native soil, one third booze blend compost, or a mixture of my home compost and booze blend. And I do one third baby booze potting soil. Um, you can do a down and dirty potting soil with a, with a, if you want to make your own with core or with peat and with pumice and with compost, but you need, you need to air, you need to add something to lighten up that soil that goes back into the hole so that the roots, those baby roots that are in those plants that you're putting back in, because remember, they're going to go into shock. They need to establish, especially especially as we get into this fall, because we might have a fall where we're still in a heavy drought. And we're going to need to have them establish in a, in, a, in, a, in a time where it could be very difficult for them to establish. So they need to have, we need to lighten up the soil. We can't put them in a heavy mix of 50-50, you know, compost and, and, and native soil. you got to lighten it up. I planted hundreds of thousands of, of, of plants, trees and shrubs in this mix. And, and have never had any fail. And that's the truth. Um, so that's it. So, you know, thank you guys. You know, I can open this thing up for questions. We can talk about whatever. Um, if you're on Instagram and Facebook, follow Malibu Compost. We have a we have a, a, a company that we're a partner in called Number Two Organics. I'd love you to check them out their website out, check out what they're doing. Pretty cool. It's a really cool reclamation project that we got involved in that, that are hundred year old dairies that they were about to throw all that material out. And um, uh, some friends of mine that are soil engineers and demolition contractors asked us to get involved in. And after doing a bunch of testing, we did. Um, so it's pretty cool. So we're doing that and um, you know, Malibu Compost is rolling along with uh, the farm in Merced and the farm up here in St. Paul. And, um, you know, I, I'll, I'll, I, I am very worried about what's happening, you know, climate wise down there in, in, in California. Uh, uh, Oregon's still in a little bit of a drought. It's, it's weird saying that when, you know, we had no spring and we had snow on our farm in April. Um, but we're still in a drought here in Oregon. And, um, you know, it's, 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 we're at, a, we're at a very strange time in the world where uh, I, I think we need to be worried about growing food and creating healthy soil and um, being able to help one another with food, if we have food shortages, which I believe, I certainly believe in other parts of the world, they're having them right now. Um, and I think that's really sad. And I think that, uh, you know, we're insulated on some level. 
because of where we live. And, and so are some of the people in Europe because of where they live. Um, but we need, how to, we need to know how to save seeds and we need to know how to save water and we need to know how to grow soil. And um, that's what I've learned, you know, from being a guy who was a landscaper, um, you know, to, uh, to being a guy who that's what's important. I, I think, you know, on a, on a social um, societal level, I think that's what's important. So um, I hope, I hope, uh, I hope this helps some of you guys. And, um, you know, uh, if you have questions to the other thing too afterwards, and you, you know, you can always uh, reach out to us at info at malibucompost.com. We get lots of questions. We answer questions. We answer all the questions that come in. Um, I probably should change that to ask Norma because my wife, Norma, who is a great um, organic farmer and biological gardener and farmer. And um, uh, she's an orchardist and she's a soil food web consultant. She's fantastic. She answers probably 90% of those questions. So it's pretty great. So um, with that, Ken, I think I need, a, I need a sip of water and I don't know if we have questions or what's up, but I think, yeah. I'm, I think I'm talked out. <laughs> All righty. Um, we definitely have questions. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, if you want to grab a sip of water, go for it. But let me scroll up and start reading a few out actually. Let's give me one moment. Okay. So first question is, where is Malibu Compost located? Where's the company located? Um, I know you briefly mentioned the farms. Um, where can people get your products and where are the farms? Um, okay, so uh, our, our headquarters is in Berkeley. Um, that's where our, our, our company headquarters is. Uh, we um, have a farm. Our main farm is in um, Oregon, St. Paul, Oregon, and our other farm is in Merced, California, and that's a co-op farm. The farm that's our, our farm is, in, uh, is about 20 minutes from where I live here in Oregon. And um, we're in Northwest up in the Willamette Valley. And our products are all over. You know, you guys are a big seller of Malibu compost and have been for years, you know. So as a retailer, if you guys are anywhere, you know, in the South Bay or in the Bay Area near, you know, Linkso, please support them because they have been wonderful supporters of not only us who are farmers and farm made you know, composters, but a, a lot of other companies, um, you know, but depending if you guys are in other areas, you can go onto our website and look at our um, store locator if you're outside of, you know, um, their reach um, and find us. We're in lots of places all over the Western, uh, we're all over the United States, basically. All right. So thanks, Randy. Uh, the next question is pertaining to tomatoes and blossom and rot. Um, do you know if it's a soil issue, water issue, or both or something else? Uh, can be water issue, can be a calcium issue, calcium deficiency. Um, definitely for sure. Uh, I've seen that. And definitely I've seen water issues too. I've seen, I've seen it, that mimic where like people, um, have uh, overwatered and then underwatered to correct, and then they've had that that issue occur. Um, so, and I think also the other thing too uh, is I also think it depends on you know we're talking about growing soil, right? So I think it also depends on what are they growing in, like what what nutrients are available in the soil for the plant especially, you know, when they're setting fruit. Okay. All righty. Um, so here's a statement followed up with a question after. So when you were talking about Aristotle, um, the comment is, isn't organic the only thing available in Aristotle's time? They weren't able to make fertilizers in labs back then. So any particular organic standards or certifications that should we that we should be looking for now? 
Yeah, no, I was, yeah, no, everything was definitely uh, organic at that point in time. It just was, I was, I'm, I was actually looking more at the term, how did we, how did we get organic from logic and reasoning, which to today, the word organic seems anything but logical or, you know, a reasonable assumption, right? So um, that's all I was thinking. I thought it was an interesting, you know, chain of how that word became, you know, where it came from. Um, so uh, Demeter has re-established itself um, with Demeter and the Biodynamic Farming Association. So it's kind of a new, it's a new thing here in uh, America, which is interesting. So they're, 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 I think it's going to be a stronger um, certifier than it's been, um, which is good. Um, I think all the certifiers are trying to get stronger. Um, I think it's hard uh, because I think a lot of times they get stuck in minutia. So um, once in a while they'll 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 look for something that I think is good. But here's the key issue for me: the, the biggest problem, right? <clears throat> To be organic, everything is supposed to, it's supposed to be non-GMO. So if I'm the only soil company still today in the United States that runs genetic IDs looking for GMOs, I'm the only one then that knows my stuff is GMO free. And then we're the only one that backs that up with um, toxicology panels so that we know that there are no compounds in there that are found in herbicides, pesticides, or fungicides. You know, so why the hell isn't everybody doing that? I, I know the answer. It's expensive. It's expensive. And because um, the waste industry that is historically the compost and soil industry, it's like the bastard stepchild that, you know, we're going to pay you to take this crap away, which is called a tipping fee. And then you're going to sell that. You're going to fluff and fold this crap. And then you're going to sell it, put it in a bag with pretty pictures on it and sell it to people. And then you're going to call it garden products. So, and so the government like they're doing their best to certify it, but they don't really know with certainty what's in one bag from another. They look what's on the label, you know? And basically you're signing an affidavit, you're signing a, a form that says that this is true. What I'm sending into you is true. Okay, well, a lot of companies that are in waste management are very, very, very large global concerns. I'm, I'm not, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a dude sitting 20 minutes from our farm in, in Oregon, south, 20 minutes, 15 minutes south of Portland. So, you know, we're a, we're a small composting company compared to a lot of the people that we are up against. But you know what, we, believe that, hey, if you are organic or you are biodynamic or you are non-GMO, then, you know, you should be. And you shouldn't be using marketing and pictures and language to, you know, trick people. Like I, I'm, you know, how, like you've heard me say this before, Ken, I like the non-GMO verified project, right? I don't, I'm not a, it's a blue butterfly that's on a zillion products now. Everything that you buy has the blue butterfly on there. I, I believe it should be a pink unicorn. Um, there's so many things out there that like, why does this need to have a non-GMO sticker on it? What could, be, what could possibly be a GMO in that product? That tells me like somebody likes the money from that certification. So I don't know, you know, for me, it's, it's another one of those things where we, that puts the, that puts the onus back on us, the citizen, 
you know, the citizenry, you, the customer, me, the farmer, to do the right thing. Or to find the research or do the research or have these conversations like this where somebody's willing to speak the truth. So I always try to speak the truth, you know, and it's not always popular and it's not always like, you know, I, you know, I'd love to be able to say like, man, I love all of them. Every, every certifier is fabulous. Every, every soil company, all my competitors are wonderful. I don't bad mouth anybody, but I'm just saying, I wish everybody would do the right thing. It would make the world a lot easier to navigate. Yeah, very true, very true. Um, okay, all right, let's go on to composting, um, backyard composting. Mm -hmm. A couple questions. One is, what do you think about constructing compost bins out of pallets, palletized materials? Um, any way to tell if the wood have been treated with chemicals at all or not? Um, and then the second part is chicken manure. If you have any experience with backyard chicken manure and how to compost that and how long does it take for it to be safe to use? Uh, okay, good question. So the pallet issue is, that's a tough one because the true, not all of them are, are um, sprayed. Uh, the, unfortunately, a lot of them are sprayed with rodenticide. Um, so, uh, you know, I don't know how you would test that one. That's a, that's a you know, like, um, I don't know. You know, for me, like, um, it wasn't that crazy expensive to make those compost bins that I made. It wasn't crazy, you know, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't nuts. And um, for the value that I get from them, I think it's worth it, you know, like, okay, so spending, spending 125 or 140 bucks on compost bins, right? Even if it's 150 or 60 bucks. Like I can spend that at Whole Foods in about a, a minute, you know, or somewhere else, right? So I look at it and go like, okay, what's my value proposition here? My value proposition here for that compost is really high. So I don't know, I, you know, but what you could be getting from having toxins put into your soil that you could maybe be picking up in, in leafy, you know, green tissue. Uh, if even that, you know, is one in a thousand, one in a hundred, like, but you got cancer from it. I, I, I it, it, it's it, crazy expensive. Um, chicken manure, backyard chicken manure is great. Um, uh, I have not backyard chicken composted, uh, manure composted myself. Uh, I've had lots of people tell me, you know, um, you know, I've had, I've had people tell me two months. I've had people tell me six months. Um, I've had people tell me they let their stuff just, you know, kind of sit out there for nine months to a year. So I would tend to, think because it's not that complex um i would go personally uh with six months at least um and really uh, i would turn it and i would put it into kind of a uh, pyramid and water it and let it break down yeah that's very true i have chickens myself and i do compost or manure so it takes anywhere from two to four months, I would say. And I do spread their manures all around. Um, so uh, not, not composted even, but I know what they're eating. So it's not, it's that's, not like crazy. That's, that's thing. <laughs> so yeah, so I'm going, so I'm saying, hey, if you want to be 100% safe at six months, nothing is going to happen. 
if you spread that chicken manure around. If you yeah. with the two month guys, uh, if you got that's I active that's, composting too, yeah, that's yeah, like you, yeah. And if you got feeder roots going, and you got you know, or and if you know, and I know people that go like, you know, we're talking weeks to a month. Uh, that's I'm not going to do that. Like I, that's you know. You know, I mean, I see people doing that with horse manure, like just, you know, like four weeks, six weeks. I'm like, you guys, come on, man. That's crazy. <laughs> that's just, that's insanity. You know, I mean, I've just seen people do stuff. So I always, especially like, like a chicken doesn't have, a, you know, the, the complex stomach, but like with a horse, I mean, you can get stuff that you don't want in your soil and in your food and in your garden, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. So, you know, be cautious, err on the side of caution. Mm -hmm. Okay, so there are a lot of questions about the nematodes that you mentioned and the beneficials. Um, and people wanna know the recommendations to buy uh, where they could buy this beneficial, the nematodes um, that you were talking about. Do you guys sell them? We don't. Okay. Yeah. Um, so most nurseries now um, carry them uh, these days. And basically what you do is they come in a, um, like a mesh and you soak it in water because they're microscopic so you can't see them you're just basically trusting them you know it's like sea monkeys right so um and you're and then you're going to use a bucket or a watering can to put them out um there is a place that we buy a lot and we have bought a lot um from called rincon r-i-n-c-o-n dash vitova v-i-t-o-v-a insectary and they um they're down in santa barbara um like at the border of santa barbara and ventura county they ship all over the world they're excellent um so you know we've we've bought a lot from them so just that's 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 a spot where when we've worked on like when norm has had multiple large orchards and food grows going and we needed um a lot of insects and and you know so it can go for a very small amount to a lot you can get them there mm -hmm. yeah and i just shared that link in the chat as well okay um all right so dr bronner's um do you spray that in the morning or evening i know you mentioned that but uh that was the question morning or evening <laughs> I, you could go either. I have, you know, I, you know, just like me with compost tea, I like to go early in the morning. Um, I like to, you know, go, you know, eight, seven, eight, nine o'clock. I like to go early. I don't like to go, I don't like to go late. And the reason I, I always tell, I'm, and I'm, has, I, in the, in the summertime, you can spray compost tea in the evening or you can spray bronners in the evening because you don't have the moisture that comes at night. Um, in the winter time, you get a lot of moisture that comes. And so I try to like, I want to spray in the morning and have it dry out during the day. Okay. Alrighty, so next question is, what would you recommend for using to make soil blocks for seed starting? <sighs> um, well, there's a lot of good ones out there. Um, there's, there's, you know. Well, Randy, don't, don't you have that new seed starter out? Yeah, I mean, for we have me, some of that. I mean, Does I mean, that solidify at all? Yeah, I mean, for me, um, I we created a seed starter that we called uh, Booze Beginnings, um, and it came from us, um, from people that we work with that do a lot of um, 
uh, did a lot of starts and needed a real organic um, and biodynamic uh, mix for their uh, seeds and seedlings. And then um, another group that needed the same thing for their microgreen grows. And they do, they sell microgreens to uh, Whole Foods all over the place. So um, we created that mix um, and um, kind of out of baby booze and then did a bunch of screening and then removed a bunch of stuff and made a really simple mix. And it works incredibly well. It's probably the best seed starting mix I've ever used myself. I use it all the time. So I love it. It's a little yellow bag, 12 quart. Um, uh, you can use it in two quarts, speed trays, you know, I mean, two inch, three inch, four inch, um, great stuff. So um, I have a lot, I have a lot of, I have a lot of um, guys I know in the cannabis world that are using that now and they're, in the, you know, to pop their beans and they're even using it in their first, first transplant. It, it, they're having so much success with it and that, it, and it, and that it's so um, what makes it different than other seed starters is it's got 25% comp of the booze blend compost in it. And most seed starting mixes have, have no organic matter and no nutrient in there. So it's a big, it's a big thing. So that works great. Um, I don't know. I have people, I, you know, that's, that's what I, that's what I do. So I use two inch, three inch, four inch and speed trace. Okay. Um, so this question is asking, what do you do, if anything special, to revive fruit trees that are established, say like five-year-old fruit, fruit trees, um, to revive the soil for them? Um, well, the first thing I would do is I would probably uh, give them a good compost tea drench um, and make sure you go from, you know, don't get the trunk all wet, but just outside of the trunk to the drip line. And then what I do is I generally go um, with about a 12 inch wide um, swath and I go out to the drip line and I, I go all the way around the drip line at about an inch to two inches and just water that in. Um, that's, you know, really kind of where I start to activate it. Did I lose you, Ken? Oh, I'm talking with mute on. My goodness, <laughs> I was just saying. Um, is, it, is it me? <laughs> so it's me. Um, I was saying we just restocked all the compost tea bags. So we've got a whole bunch and I was just sending the link out um, on the chat. So maybe um, you could just share with us briefly on how to do the little uh, compost tea bags and make that into just the five gallon buckets of tea. Yeah. The, the great thing with that is, um, so I, you know, for, for, if you're in a, if you're in a place that has municipal water, I just go ahead and, and make a bucket or two, um, uh, a five, you know, five gallon bucket. I fill it up, give myself like, you know, uh, three to four inches of free board from the top down. And then I let it off gas overnight just to make sure it dechlorinates. And then what I do, um, or during the day, excuse me, I just do it during the day, I off gas it. And then I throw my uh, tea bag in at night and let it soak overnight. And then what I do is I squeeze, I, I, when I first throw the tea bag in, I give it a couple of good squeezes and a couple of stirs and then I just let it sit. And then in the morning, I give, I really stir it like multiple times for a couple minutes back and forth and kind of get a little vortex going in there. And, and then I'm, I'm either ready to use it as a drench or use it as a foliar. Um, what I do like on that fruit tree question, you know, I just basically, you know, um, put it in my watering can or in a bucket. If you're good at holding a bucket, buckets can be tough because five gallon buckets are a little tough to, you know, use. So a lot of times having a watering can, that's why I showed the pictures of the watering can. That's pretty easy to, to control. 
and you can just, you know, do it that way. I like the little, also the little half, like you have them, the little half gallon and one gallon sprayers. I love those because they're so light and they're so easy to just kind of walk around and, you know, when I'm doing a foliar application. Um, I find that those little tea bags, because you get four tea bags in each, each one, um, you, so that means you can do 20 gallons of tea in them and they're really cost effective. Um, you're getting a really good value and you get such a huge bang for your buck, you know? So on that person that needs to revitalize that soil for their fruit trees, they could do that same app process, you know, uh, uh, like they could do the, the tea part of it twice after they've done the composting and really get that stuff kind of going if that soil has just been kind of sitting there stagnant for a while. And that goes for any, any area in the garden. You know, if you've really not fed or not, you know, given much attention to an area in the garden for a while, the compost tea is, it's, I call it the greatest cheat in organic gardening. I, I use it all the time. Okay, and then a um, uh, question regarding that is, you know, most people have city water, which has chloramines in it. Yep. Uh, to dissipate the chloramines, I usually um, add some humic acid to that. Um, what is your thought on that? or do you use humic acid at all? Um, well, you can. Um, the other thing that happens is there's humic acid in the um, compost, so um, in, in the tea, so it will do the same thing. Um, uh, Norma likes to throw a little bit of humic acid in to her mix. I'm <laughs> sometimes I'm like a little bit more like just running around like chicken with my head cut off sometimes, and I'm just throwing tea bags and doing this and doing that. And I'm, you know, and if I remember, I do, if not, I forget it. I I'm okay. Already. I, I trust, I trust the microbes. I trust the compost. I trust that the humic acid in it will, will, will bind the, the chloramine. Yeah. Um, okay. Sorry. So going back to the nematode, question. I'm sure, you know, folks reached out to Rincon Vitova. They could answer this as well, but I'll ask you anyway. Um, are there any nematodes that work in California, like desert area or like um, coast, coastal like nematodes or desert? I'm sure there are like different well, yeah, I mean, I've, I've used, but I've used, um, I've definitely, um, um, use the uh, SC nematodes in the coastal area and I've used them. Well, here's an odd thing. Um, in the desert, uh, we had a root feeding nematode problem um, down in the Palm Springs area. And that was because the people weren't using enough organic matter when they planted stuff. So what we ended up having to do was add more compost and compost tea um, into those areas and that fixed that problem. Um, so I'm not sure they would answer that question specifically to the region, but I didn't have to add any, in my working situation down there, I didn't have to add any of the nematodes down there. I just but on the coast, I've, I've used the SE a lot. All righty. Uh, so a couple more questions here, Randy, and then we'll, we'll send off here. But uh, the next question is, um, I know you had mentioned like GMO versus non-GMO fertilizers and all that. Um, a lot of folks use feather meal, organic feather meal to add or replenish nitrogen, uh, slow release nitrogen. Do you have any suggestions um, for nitrogen that are non-GMO and organic? Yeah, I mean, I, it's interesting. Well, I mean, I, I mean, first of all, I mean, I, I, they're looking for a high nitrogen, I don't, depending on what they're needing it for. I find that when I use enough, when I do comp, when I compost and when I use compost tea, the tea with frequency, 
and I do um, amending, you know, occasionally amend, um, I get my soil is balanced. I don't need um, to add high nitrogen. I get my, my plants get enough nitrogen and they, I get, they uptake what they need. Um, if I need additional nitrogen, like for, let's take, for example, like, like a rose, it's heavily feeding, right? Um, I do what I said with that little mush that I make with the alfalfa pellets, just take a little handful, like that much in like three or four gallons of water, three gallons of water, let's say, it fills up you know, a half a bucket and I just throw it around my roses and they absorb that and get a ton of extra nitrogen. Yeah. And, um, I mean, there, there are folks that just prefer like sort of like, uh, marine, um, fertilizers like crab meal has excellent nitrogen too. I mean, not like high nitrogen, but you know, enough balanced nitrogen. Yeah. Well, that, that's why if you take like, you can use like a crab meal or a, a even, even um, the fish bone meal or a shrimp meal. And yeah, know, that's why the, like the bio live yeah. that person, that's an excellent product. Yeah. That's, that's usually what we recommend. Um, that would be, that would be a great product. And then take that at a 16th of an inch and then cover it with a little bit of compost to activate it and water it in. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Okay, so let's do the, this is the last question here, but I'm not entirely sure. Maybe this person can clarify on the chat, but I'll just read the question to you. Um, so this person's having a lot of jumping earthworms in their soil. Uh, vegetable bed and raised beds, um, which then transforms good soil to dry and cramped soil within a few months. And they're asking, what is the solution? Um, I'm not, earthworms are good. Jumping earthworms, I'm not so sure. And typically they don't really dry out the soil. So I'm not sure what's going on there. I have not had this experience. So I don't, know how to speak to this experience because I don't know this experience. Um, did they say the soil was super dry or was just this was they well, thought this was the cause of it drying out or I'm wondering if that's the I wonder yeah. if that's the secondary issue because I don't I, I, I have not ever encountered this type of a problem. Yeah, I mean, when you usually have earthworms, the soil is pretty nice and they, 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 workable. They, they can't survive in dry, they don't stay in a dry soil. I mean, I mean, they need moisture. Yeah. Their environment is moist. They need that for, you know, um, the mucilage on the sides of their body for even how they move and how they, huh. you know, so I don't, um, I would need to know more. I'd probably even need to see like, a, like, I, I need to like, I would need to know more and see some more because I'm not really sure. And that might even be an interesting question for Rincon Vitoba because I, they get hit with so many interesting types of soil animal and insect related questions that yeah. I try to answer what I have experience with, you know, um, uh, I don't even know anecdotally how I would answer that question. It's so funny. So someone else responded in the chat saying that it could be the Asian jumping worm, which is not really the earthworms. They're like Amemphis agrestis. I'm probably pronouncing that wrong, but uh, it's in the Megascoliacetae family or something. Um, I'm just going to copy and paste this in the chat for the person. Um, but they're saying it, they have smooth, glossy, gray, brown body with milky white um them and they can range blah 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 anyway paste that on there but i don't think they're earthworms which is really weird earthworms from my experience don't live in dry arid soils so could be a non-native species that do degrade soils so that makes a lot more sense because um 
No, I mean, my, cause like, you know, uh, you know, like I've told you about the wine experience we had where we had the, the area out in, uh, um, the, the, on the golf courses in Thousand Oaks, they had an area where they could not get the, the, the turf to grow and, and they were having a really hard time because it was very dry on over a barranca and uh, they tested a bunch of different types of compost and they gave like 12 by 12 sections and in, in the section that we were at, um, our section was the one that the agronomist called us and said, hey, you've got worm, there's earthworms actually in your section after about three weeks. Um, and there was moisture retention in our section. So in the other areas, there were no worms. There was no nothing there, you know, it was devoid of life basically. Um, so, you know, they'll go where there's food, they'll go, you know, so there was bacteria there, there was moisture there. And all of a sudden, lo and behold, there were earthworms there, you know, so, um, and we've been on that stretch of that golf course now for going on 10 years. So, hmm. This could be, you know, for me, I, I agree with you. To me, it sounds like a an invasive species that's not native, that isn't, that could have been introduced randomly, you know, and I, I don't know, you know, so it'd be one of those things where I would have to know more because I don't, I haven't, I haven't run across this issue. Yeah, I, w I just put a CD. I've heard, I've heard of jumping worms, but I have not heard of earthworms jumping. And I have not, because it's also doesn't make sense. Because like, I agree with you, Ken, because that's not, their environment is, is subterranean. Yeah, yeah, right? exactly. So it, it, this seems like a, probably like a pest of some kind. And a lot of folks are throwing out resources in the chat here. So I'll just share that with um, everybody. Okay. So, cool. Yeah. yeah. Cause Hey, who knows? I, I hope now that I, cause I'm hearing about it. I don't come across them. Um, I'm, hoping, I'm, hoping it's, I'm hoping it's not one of those where I yeah. don't now have to deal with it. <laughs> Probably. Cause it sounds like they're, they're already pretty bad here. So um, I've shared some CDFA resources and UC Davis uh, resources there. So take a look. Um, okay. But with that saying, you know, we, I mean, we found earthworms in your compost bags, you know, sealed up and several months later, they're still happy in there and nice and moist. Um, so, you know, it's, it, they like moist soil and uh, good soil, not really dry. Yep arid soil so great so i think that's pretty much all um the questions that we've got here andy but i just i just want to say any closing remarks from you before we sign off great questions and uh, as usual just you know I, I always you know what i would expect and i just um i just hope that you know in this time that we're all living in that we can like Go back to the soil. Like just go back to the soil and 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 you know focus there and focus on the commonality and not the differences and um, and you know and 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 remember you know we all have a lot of bacteria and a lot of microbes. So we're made up of a lot of microbes and the soil is made up of a lot of microbes and there's a lot more commonalities and there are differences and 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 you know and and try to remember that and try to like treat each other with respect and dignity and you know and if we can all do that we'll be okay you know and and just you know and i i really and i and i appreciate having a forum like this and i appreciate you bringing us all together can and and um you guys reach out to me you can always get me info at malibucompost.com and I really look forward to the day um, we can do this in person again, Ken. I hope we yeah. can sometime soon, you know? I, I love doing that. I miss that. I miss, um, I miss uh, you know, saying hello to you and as we walk in to start this and, you know, and seeing everybody's expression on their faces and, um, you know, and, ha and that, 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 you know, right away as we all kind of, you know, um, get energy off of each other, you know, all of our, each other, you know, I, I love that. So I, I really do miss that. And I, but I'm very grateful for the opportunity to be able to talk to all of you guys. So yeah. thank you.
Thank you so much, Randy. Um, it's always so great to hear you speak and always new information, every class. So, um, and thank you everybody for attending. This class will be posted on our website by tomorrow. So look forward to that. And if you have any questions, just feel free to email Randy or myself and we'll get back to you um, if we did not address any of the questions in the chat today. So again, thank you for attending and thank you again, Randy. And I'll see you next week for another class. Bye guys. Bye everybody.